The Last Vampire by Christopher Pike Chapter 9 Once more I go back. We left the area, Yaksha and I. We were quickly joined by two of the men from the village who had disappeared. They were vampires. I was a vampire. But that word did not exist then. I didn't know what I was, except somehow I was like Yaksha. The horror and wonder of it all. My craving for blood did not come over me in the first days, and Yaksha must have told the others not to speak to me about it, because they did not but I did notice that bright light bothered me. The rays of the midday sun were almost intolerable. This I understood, because when we were growing up, I had noticed that Yaksha had a tendency to disappear in the middle of the day. It saddened me that I would never again enjoy a wonderful daytime sky. Yet the nights, they became a thing of great beauty, for I could see in the dark better than I had been able to see in the day. I would look up at the moon and see that it was not the smooth orb we had all believed but a pitted and scarred world with no air. Distant objects would appear before me as if only an arm's length away. I could see detail I had never imagined before, the pores of my skin, the multifaceted eyes of tiny insects, sound even on supposedly silent plain became a constant. I quickly became sensitive to the breathing patterns of different people. What each rhythm meant, how it corresponded to different emotions. My sense of smell took on an incredible vitality. With just a slight shift of the breeze, the world was constantly bathed in new perfumes. My newfound strength I loved most of all. I could leap to the top of the tallest tree, crumble huge boulders with a clap of my hands. I loved to chase the animals, especially the lions and tigers. They ran from me. They knew there was something inhuman about me. But my blood hunger came over me quickly. On the fourth day I went to Yaksha and told him my chest was on fire and my heart was pounding in my ears. Honestly, I thought I was dying. I kept thinking about bleeding things. Yet I did not think of drinking blood. It was too impossible an idea. Even when Yaksha told me it was the only way to stop the pain, I pushed it out of my mind. Because even though I was no longer human, I wanted to pretend I was. When Yaksha had held me that long night, I felt myself die. Yet I imagined that I was alive, as others were alive. But the life in me was not from this world. I could live off that life, but I could never give in to it. Yaksha told me I was sterile. At the same time, he told me about the blood. 
it made me cry for Lalita and Rama and wonder how they were doing without their Sita. But I would not go to see them. I would not let them see the monster I had become. I feared I would make them vampires too. I resisted drinking another's blood until pain was all I knew. I grew weak. I couldn't stop moaning. It was as if because I would not drink another's blood, then the thing Yaksha had put inside me would eat me alive. A month after my transformation, Yaksha bought me a half-conscious boy with his neck veins already partially open and ordered me to drink. How I hated him then for putting such temptation in front of me. How it rekindled in me my hatred for how he had taken me from Rama and Lalita. Yet my hate did not give me strength, because it was not a pure thing. I needed Yaksha after he changed me and need is a close kin of love. But I would not say I ever loved Yaksha. Rather, I looked up to him because he was greater than I was. For a long time, he was the only one to look up to. Until Krishna... Yet I drank the boy's blood. I fell upon him even as I swooned. And even though I resolved not to kill him, I couldn't stop drinking once I started. Then the boy was dead. I cried in horror as he took his last breath in my arm. But Yaksha just laughed. He said that once you killed, it was easy to kill again. Yes, I hated him then, because I knew he was right. After that, I killed many and I grew to love it. The years went by. We headed southeast. We never stopped moving. It never took that long for people in a village to realize we were dangerous. We came. We made friends. Eventually, we slew, and the rumors went before us. We also made more of our kind. The first vampire I created was a girl my age, with large dark eyes and hair like a waterfall made from the light of the midnight sky. I imagined she could become a friend even though I took her against her will. By then, Yaksha had told me what was necessary, the lifting out of my vein coming from my heart, the merger of her vein going back to the heart, the transfusion, the terror, the ecstasy. Her name was Mataji, and she never thanked me for what I did to her, but she stayed close in the years to come. Making Mataji drained my strength, and it was several days and many victims later 
before I regained my full powers. It was the same for all of us, except Yaksha. When he created another, he just grew stronger. I knew it was because it was his soul that fed us all. The Yakshini embodied the demon from the deep. Yet there was kindness in him, but I couldn't understand its source. He was protective of all he created, and he was unusually nice to me. He never again told me that he loved me. But he did. His eyes were often on me. What was I supposed to do? The damned could not marry. God would not witness the union as we had been taught from the Vedas. It was then, maybe after fifty years of being a vampire, that we began to hear stories about a man many said was the Veda incarnate. A man who was more than a man, perhaps Lord Vishnu himself. Each new village we plundered bought us another detail. His principal name was Krishna, and he lived in the forests of Vrindavana near the Yamana River with the cow herders and their milkmaids, the gopis they were called. It was said, this man, this Vashudeva, he had many names, was capable of slaying demons and granting bliss. His best friends were the five Pandava brothers, who had the reputation of being the incarnation of more minor deities. Arjuna, one of the brothers, had almost the fame of Krishna. He was said to be the son of the great god Indra, the lord of paradise. We did not doubt, from what we heard, that Arjuna was indeed a magnificent warrior. Yaksha was intrigued. The rest of us vampires were as well. But few of us wanted to meet Krishna, because even though our numbers by then were close to a thousand, we felt Krishna would not greet us with open arms. And if half the stories told about him and his friends were true, he might destroy us all. But Yaksha could not bear the thought that there is a man in the land more powerful than he, because his reputation had grown great as well, although it was the notoriety of terror. We set out for Vrindavana, all of us, and we marched openly, making no secret of our destination. The many mortals whom we passed seemed happy, for they believed our wandering herd of blood drinkers was doomed. I saw the gratitude in their faces, and felt the fear in my heart. None of these people had personally met Krishna, yet they believed in him. They simply trusted in the sound of his name, even as we slew many of them, they called out to Krishna. Of course Krishna knew we were coming, it required no omniscience on his part. Yaksha had a shrewd intellect, yet it was clouded by the arrogance 
his powers had given him. As we entered the forests of Vrindavana, all seemed calm. Indeed, the woods appeared deserted, even to us with acute hearing. But Krishna was only saving his attack until we were deep into his land. All of a sudden, arrows began to fly towards us. Not a rain of them, but one at a time. Yet in quick succession and fired with perfect accuracy. Truly, not one of those arrows missed its target. They went through the hearts and heads of our kind. They never failed to kill that which Yaksha told us could not be killed. And the most amazing thing is we could not catch the man who shot the arrows. We could not even see him. His garage, his mystical armor, was that great. After that, I killed many, and I grew to love it. The years went by, we headed southeast, we never stopped moving. It never took that long for people in a village to realize we were dangerous. We came, we made friends, eventually we slew and the rumors went before us. We also made more of our kind. The first vampire I created was a girl my age, with large dark eyes and hair like a waterfall made from the light of the midnight sky. I imagined she could become a friend, even though I took her against her will. By then Yaksha had told me what was necessary, the lifting out of my vein coming from my heart, the merger of her vein going back to the heart, the transfusion, the terror, the ecstasy. Her name was Mataji and she never thanked me for what I did to her, but she stayed close in the years to come. Making Mataji drained my strength, and it was several days and many victims later before I regained my full powers. It was the same for all of us, except Yaksha. When he created another, he just grew stronger. I knew it was because it was his soul that fed us all. The Yakshini embodied the demon from the deep. Yet there was kindness in him, but I couldn't understand its source. He was protective of all he created, and he was unusually nice to me. He never again told me that he loved me. But he did. His eyes were often on me. What was I supposed to do? The damned could not marry. God would not witness the union as we had been taught from the Vedas. It was then, maybe after fifty years of being a vampire, that we began to hear stories about a man many said was the Veda incarnate. A man who was more than a man, perhaps Lord Vishnu himself. Each new village we plundered bought us another detail. His principal name 
was Krishna, and he lived in the forests of Vrindavana near the Yamana River with the cow herders and their milkmaids, the gopis they were called. It was said this man, this Vashudeva, he had many names, was capable of slaying demons and granting bliss. His best friends were the five Pandava brothers who had the reputation of being the incarnation of more minor deities. Arjuna, one of the brothers, had almost the fame of Krishna. He was said to be the son of the great god Indra, the lord of paradise. We did not doubt from what we heard that Arjuna was indeed a magnificent warrior. Yaksha was intrigued. The rest of us vampires were as well, but few of us wanted to meet Krishna because even though our numbers by then were close to a thousand, we felt Krishna would not greet us with open arms. And if half the stories told about him and his friends were true, he might destroy us all. But Yaksha could not bear the thought that there is a man in the land more powerful than he, because his reputation had grown great as well, although it was the notoriety of terror. We set out for Vrindavana, all of us, and we marched openly, making no secret of our destination. The many mortals whom we passed seemed happy, for they believed our wandering herd of blood drinkers was doomed. I saw the gratitude in their faces, and felt the fear in my heart. None of these people had personally met Krishna, yet they believed in him. They simply trusted in the sound of his name, even as we slew many of them, they called out to Krishna. Of course Krishna knew we were coming. It required no omniscience on his part. Yaksha had a shrewd intellect, yet it was clouded by the arrogance his powers had given him. As we entered the forests of Vrindavana, all seemed calm. Indeed, the woods appeared deserted, even to us with acute hearing. But Krishna was only saving his attack until we were deep into his land. All of a sudden, arrows began to fly towards us. Not a rain of them, but one at a time, yet in quick succession and fired with perfect accuracy. Truly, not one of those arrows missed its target. They went through the hearts and heads of our kind. They never failed to kill that which Yaksha told us could not be killed. And the most amazing thing is we could not catch the man who shot the arrows. We could not even see him. His kavach, his mystical armor, was that great. Mataji was one of the first to fall, an arrow between her eyes. Still, we were many and it was going to take time even for the finest archer of all time to kill us. Yaksha drove us forward, as fast as we could go. Then the arrows began to strike only the rear of our contingent, 
and then they ceased altogether. It appeared that we had been able to outrun even Arjuna, but we had left many behind. Rebellion stirred against Yaksha. Most wanted to leave Vrindavana if they knew which way to flee. For the first time, Yaksha was losing command. But it was then, in those enchanted woods, that we came across what at first seemed to Yaksha a great boon. We ran into Radha, the chief of the gopis, Krishna's consort. We had heard about Radha as well, whose name meant longing. She was called this because she longed for Krishna even more than she desired to breathe. She was picking jasmines by the clear waters of the Yamuna when we came across her. We did not frighten her. She actually smiled when she saw us. Her beauty was extraordinary. I had never seen, and never would see, in five thousand years, such an exquisite female. Her skin was remarkably fair. Her face shone with the subtle radiance of moonlight. Her form was shapely. She moved as if in a joyful theater. Each turn of her arm bending of knees seemed to bring bliss. It was because each step she took, she took with the thought of Krishna. She was singing a song about him when we came upon her. In fact, the first words out of her mouth were to ask us if we wanted to learn it. Yaksha immediately took her captive. She did not try to hide her identity. We bound her wrists and ankles. I was put in charge of her while Yaksha sent several of our kind calling through the woods that we had Radha and that we were going to kill her unless Krishna agreed to meet Yaksha in single combat. It did not take Krishna long to respond. He sent Yudhishthira, Arjuna's brother, with a message. He would meet us at the edge of Vrindavana, where we had entered the woods. If we did not know how to find it, Yudhishthira would show us the way. He had only two conditions, that we not harm Radha, and that he got to choose the form of combat. Yaksha sent Yudhishthira back, saying that he accepted the challenge. It may have been that we should have asked Yudhishthira which way to go. The woods were like a maze and Radha was not talking. Yet she did not seem afraid. Occasionally she would glance my way and smile with such calm assurance that it was I who knew fear. Yaksha was ecstatic. He did not believe any mortal beat him at any form of combat. By such a pronouncement, he appeared to discount the stories concerning Krishna's divine origin. Yet when I asked him about that, he did not answer me. He had a light in his eyes, though. He said that he had been born for this moment. Personally, I was fearful of a trick. Krishna had a reputation for being mischievous. 
Yaksha brushed aside my concerns. He would destroy Krishna, he said, and then he would make Radha a vampire. She would be his consort. I did not feel jealous. I did not think it would happen. Eventually, we found our way back to the place where we had entered the forest. We remembered the spot because there was a huge pit in the ground. Apparently, Krishna intended to use this pit when he challenged Yaksha. His people were gathered about it when we came out of the woods. Yet they made no attempt to attack us, although our numbers were roughly equal. I saw Arjuna standing near his brothers, his mighty bow in his hands. When he looked my way and saw me holding on to Radha, he frowned and took an arrow into his hands and rubbed it to his chest, but he did nothing more. He was waiting for his master. We were all waiting. In that moment, even though I was not yet seventy years old, I felt as if I had waited since the dawn of creation to see this person, I who held captive his great jewel. Krishna came out of the forest. He was not a blue person, as he was later to be depicted in paintings. Artists were to show him that way, only because blue was symbolic of the sky, which to them seemed to stretch to infinity, and which was what Krishna was supposed to be in essence, the eternal infinite Brahman, above and beyond which there was nothing greater. He was a man, such as all men I had seen, with two arms and two legs, one head above his shoulders, his skin the color of tea with milk in it, not as dark as most in India, but not as light as my own. Yet, there was no one like him. Even a glance showed me that he was special in a way I knew I would never fully comprehend. He walked out of the trees, and all eyes followed him. He was tall, almost as tall as Yaksha, which was unusual for those days when people seldom grew to over six feet. His black hair was long. One of his many names was Keshava, master of the senses, or long-haired. In his right hand, he held a lotus flower. In his left, his fabled flute. He was powerfully built, his legs long, his every movement bewitching. He seemed not to look at anyone directly, but only to give sidelong glances. Yet these were enough to send a thrill through the crowd, on both sides. He was impossible not to stare at, though I tried to turn away. For I felt as if he were placing a spell over me that I would never recover from. Yet I did manage to turn aside for an instant. It was when I felt the touch of a hand on my brow. It was Radha, my supposed enemy, comforting me with her touch. Krishna means love, she said. 
but Radha means longing. Longing is older than love. I am older than he. Did you know that, Sita? I looked at her. How did you know my name? He told me. What? When? Once? What else did he tell you about me? Her face darkened. You do not want to know. Krishna walked to the edge of the pit and gestured for his people to withdraw to the edge of the trees. Only Arjuna remained with him. He nodded to Yaksha, who likewise motioned for our people to back up. But Yaksha wanted me near the pit, with my hands not far from Radha's neck. The arrangement did not seem to bother Krishna. He met Yaksha not far from where I stood. Krishna did not look directly at Radha or me, yet he was close enough so that I could hear him speak. His voice was mesmerizing. It was not so much the sound of his words, but the place from which they sprang, their authority and power, and yes, love. I could hear love even as he spoke to his enemy. There was such peace in his tone. With all that was happening, he was not disturbed. I had the feeling that for him it was merely a play, that we were all just actors in a drama he was directing but I was not enjoying the part I had been selected for. I did not see how Yaksha could beat Krishna. I felt sure that this day would be our last. Yet it was not day but night, although the dawn was not far off. I have heard that Yaksha is the master of serpents. Krishna said that the sound of his flute intoxicates them, as you may have heard. I also play the flute. It is in my mind to challenge you to a combat of instruments. We will fill this pit with cobras, and you will sit at one end, and I will sit at the other, and we will each play for the control of the serpents. We will play for the life of Radha. You may play what you wish, and if the serpents strike me dead, so be it. You may keep Radha for your own pleasure. But if the serpents should bite you so many times that you die, or decide to surrender, then you must swear to me now that you will take a vow that I will ask you to take. Is this a reasonable challenge? Yes, Yaksha said. His confidence leapt even higher, and I knew how strong Yaksha was with snakes. I had watched him many times while he had hypnotized snakes with the sound of his flute. It never surprised me, because sometimes Yakshinis were depicted as serpents, and I thought Yaksha was a snake at heart. In reality, vampires have more in common with snakes than bats. A snake prefers to eat its victim alive. I knew Yaksha could be bitten many times by a cobra and not die. Krishna left it to our people to gather the cobras, which took time because there were none in the forests of Vrindavana itself. 
that vampires can work fast if they must, and travel far, and by the following evening the pit was filled with deadly snakes. Now the feeling in our group favored Yaksha. Few believed a mortal could survive for any length of time in the pit. It was then that I saw that even Krishna had impressed the vampires. They still thought of him as a man, an extraordinary man, true, but not as a divine being. They were anxious for the contest to begin. I stayed with Radha throughout the day. I talked to her about Rama and Lalita. She told me that they had both passed out of this world, but that Rama's life had been noble and my daughter's had been happy. I did not ask how she knew these things. I simply believed her. I cried at her words. Radha tried to comfort me. All that are born die, she said. All who die are reborn. It is inevitable. Krishna had told her. She told me many things Krishna had said. Finally, close to dark, Yaksha and Krishna climbed into the pit. Each carried a flute, nothing more. The people on both sides watched, but from a distance as Krishna had wanted. Only Radha and I stood close to the pit. There had to be a hundred snakes in that huge hole. They bit each other, and more than a few were already being eaten. Yaksha and Krishna sat at opposite ends of the pit, each with his back to the wall of earth. They began to play immediately. They had to. The snakes moved for each of them right away. But with the sound of the music, both melodies, the snakes backed off and appeared uncertain. Now, Yaksha could play wonderfully, although his songs were always laced with sorrow and pain. His music was hypnotic. He could draw victims to feed on simply with his flute, but I realized instantly that his playing, for all its power, was a mere shadow next to Krishna's music. For Krishna played the song of life itself. Each note on his flute was like a different center in the human body. His breath through the notes on the flute was like the universal breath through the bodies of all people. He would play the third note on his flute, and the third center in my body, at the navel, would vibrate with different emotions. The navel is the seat of jealousy and attachment and of joy and generosity. I felt these as he played. When Krishna would blow through this hole with a heavy breath, I would feel as if everything I had ever called mine had been stripped away. But when he would change his breath, let the notes go long and light, I would smile and want to give something to those around me. Such was his mastery. His playing had the snakes completely bewildered. None would attack him. Yet Yaksha was able to keep the snakes at bay with his music as well although he was not able to send them after his foe. So the contest went on for a long time without either side hurting the other. Yet it was clear to me Krishna was in command, 
as he was in control of my emotions. He moved to the fifth note on the flute, which stirred the fifth center in my body at the throat. In that spot there were two emotions, sorrow and gratitude. Both emotions bring tears, one bitter, the other sweet. When Krishna lowered his breath, I felt like weeping. When he sang higher, I also felt choked, but with thanks. Yet I did not know what I was thankful for, not the outcome of the contest, surely. I knew then that the Yaksha would certainly lose, and that the result could be nothing other than our extinction, even as the recognition of our impending doom crossed my mind, Krishna began to play the fourth note. This affected my heart. It affected the hearts of all gathered. In the heart are three emotions. I felt them then. Love, fear, and hatred. I could see that an individual could only have one of the three at a time. When you were in love, you knew no fear or hatred. When you were fearful, there was no possibility of love or hate. And when there was hate, there was only hate. Krishna played the fourth note softly initially so that a feeling of warmth swept both sides. This he did for a long time, and it seemed as if vampires and mortals alike stared across the clearing at one another and wondered why they were enemies. Such was the power of that one note, perfectly pitched. Yet Krishna now pushed his play toward its climax. He lowered his breath, and the love in the gathering turned to hate. A restlessness went through the crowd, and individuals on both sides shifted this way and that, as if preparing to attack. Then Krishna played the fourth note in a different way, and the hate changed to fear. And finally, this emotion pierced Yaksha, who had so far remained unmoved by Krishna's flute. I saw him tremble, the worst thing he could do, before a swarm of snakes. Because a serpent only strikes where there is fear. The group of snakes began to crawl toward Yaksha. He could have surrendered then, but he was a brave creature even if he was ruthless. He continued to play, now a frantic tune to drive away the snakes. At first it did slow them down, but Krishna did not tire. He continued on the fourth note, his breath quivering up and down through the hole, and at last a large snake slithered up to Yaksha. It bit him on the shin and held on fast with its teeth. Yaksha could not afford to set down his flute to throw it off. Then another snake came forward, and still another until soon Yaksha was being bitten on every part of his body. He was the king of vampires, the son of a Yakshini, yet even his system could absorb only so much venom. At last the flute fell from his hands, and he swayed where he sat. I believe he tried to call out. I think he might have said my name. Then he toppled forward 
and the snakes began to eat him. I could not bear to watch. But Krishna stood then and set his flute aside. He clapped his hands, and the snakes hurried off Yaksha's body. He climbed out of the pit and motioned to Arjuna. His best friend entered the deep hole and carried out Yaksha's body and dumped it on the ground not far from me. He was breathing, I could see that, but barely, soaked head to foot with black venom. It oozed out of the many wounds on his body. I let Radha go. She hugged me before leaving, but she did not run to Krishna, but to the other women. Behind me, I could hear the main body of the vampires shifting toward the woods, as if they planned to flee. Yet they waited still. They felt compelled to, I think, to see what Krishna would do next. Krishna ignored them. He gestured to me and came and knelt beside Yaksha. My feeling then was so peculiar. As I knelt beside Krishna, this being that would in all probability wipe me from the face of the earth, I felt as if I was under the umbrella of his protection. I watched as he put one of his beautiful hands on Yaksha's head. Will he live? I asked. Krishna surprised me with his question. Do you want him to? My eyes strayed over the ruin of my old enemy and friend. I want what you want, I whispered. Krishna smiled, so serene. The age is to change when I leave this world. Kali Yuga will begin. It will be a time of strife and short years for humanity. Your kind is for the most part tamasic, negative. Kali Yuga will be challenge enough for people without you on earth. Do you agree? Yes, we cause only suffering. Then why do you go on, Sita? At his saying my name, I felt so touched. I just want to live, Lord. He nodded. I will let you live if you obey my command. If you never make another of your kind, you will have my grace, my protection. I lowered my head. Thank you, my lord. He gestured toward the vampires. Go stand with them. I must talk to your leader. His days are not over. They will not be over for a long time. I moved to leave, but Krishna stopped me. Sita. I turned to look into his face one last time. It was as if I could see the whole universe in his eyes. Maybe he was God. Maybe he was simply enlightened. I didn't care right then, in that blessed moment. I just loved him. Later, though, the love was to turn to hate, to fear. They seemed so opposite, the feelings, yet they were all one note on his flute. 
truly he had stolen my heart. Yes, Lord, I said. He bid me lean close to his lips. Where there is love, there is my grace, he whispered. Remember that. I will try, my lord. I went and stood with the others. Krishna revived Yaksha and spoke softly in his ear. When Krishna was done, Yaksha nodded. Krishna bade him climb to his feet, and we saw that Yaksha's wounds were gone. Yaksha walked towards us. Krishna says we can go, he said. What did he tell you? I asked. I cannot say. What did he tell you? I cannot say. Yet it was not long before I learned part of what Krishna had told Yaksha. Yaksha secretly began to execute each of the vampires. His acts did not stay secret long. I fled, we all did, but he hunted down the others over the long years, even after Krishna was gone and Kali Yuga reigned. Yaksha chased them to the ends of the earth over the many centuries until there were none left that I knew of, except me. Yet he never came for me, and in the Middle Ages, as the black plague swept Europe, I heard that he was accused of being a witch, and also hunted down by an entire army, and burned to ash in an old castle. I cried when the news came to me, because even though he had stolen what I loved, he had, in a sense, created what I was. He was my lord as Krishna was my lord. I served both masters, light and darkness, both of which I had seen in Krishna's eyes. Even the devil does God's will. I never made another vampire, but I never stopped killing. End of chapter